Yeah, so share. Have you hey. got that? Bit? How are yeah. you, mate? I'm very well, man. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real, real pleasure. Um, and I was reading your notes earlier that you've uh, toured with Lana Del Rey, Emily Sanders, uh, one of my favourites, Katie Tunstall, and mm. of course, Paloma Faith. And um, your career started at a real young age, didn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, technically, I'm still on my gap year. Like, I was actually meant to be going to uni to read English. Um, I was, I think it was Warwick I got accepted into. I've been saying that for years, but actually, it might have been, that might be a lie now. I can't actually remember. <laughs> um, but um, insert good university here. Um, yeah, I was going to, yeah, I love, I love books. I love uh, writing. My brother, Bengo, in particular, uh, we're both sort of sci-fi geeks. Um, and I thought... I was going to potentially be a writer because I didn't really see how you could make doing music a job. I wasn't really thinking it of it necessarily that way. Um, but while on this gap year, um, I was sleeping on my brother Benga's couch um, and he was playing bass for bass guitar. So my brother Benga Delican, he's also in a band called Metronomy. Um, and I was sleeping on his couch and he was playing for this indie singer songwriter called Jeremy Wormsley at the time. Uh, and he was like, look, you're not really doing anything. I'm, I can't do this tour. It was like, come on, it was like November, 2007 or something like that. I can't do this tour, try out and see if you can cover me for this tour. Um, and I did. And sort of very long story short, I'm still on my gap. Yeah. <laughs> That's an amazing story. <laughs> so where did you grow up? I've kind of grown up all over the place, but I was born in Nigeria. My dad, my dad's Nigerian, my mum's Kenyan, um, and they met at Manchester University, so sort of already kind of a bit of a mad one. Um, but yeah, born in Nigeria, moved to Holland when I was two. Um, so like my first memories of the world are actually in Holland. Um, so this like big Nigerian family and <laughs> sticking out in the, Den Haag, um, youngest of six kids. Uh, but yeah, grew up in Holland for a bit. Then I moved back to Nigeria when I was six. Um, moved here when I was nine. Then I did my sixth form in Ecuador and moved back. Um, so kind of, I kind of have been training to be a touring musician, sort of, I guess, um, forever. Because yeah, we moved around a lot. And uh, I like to think that that's, that's been a sort of real strength I think um I'm not kind I'm kind of all right with being in new situations being around yeah. new people yeah. yeah and and uh was music always in your blood growing up I mean it pretty much couldn't be more in my blood like uh so my mum's a musician she studied music um she she had a brief she started a career I think she she was t doing music for like a Nigerian on like a Nigerian TV station, I think on NTA or something. Um, but she, yeah, she learned music. She actually taught my dad a few guitar chords. Um, but we used to sing as a family, uh, like I grew up in a Christian family. So we obviously go, go to church um, every weekend, but Monday to Saturday, we'd meet as a family every evening, read the Bible, pray, but we had the song books from church um, and just from different sort of Christian songbooks. And we'd sing as a family every night, all eight of us. Um, this was in Holland, uh, in like three part harmony, uh, which I was just learning. I didn't really know. I didn't get any sort of formal, necessarily formal teaching that, oh, this is a third and this is a fifth and this is a seventh, this is a ninth. Um, but I could just hear my brothers and sisters doing it and my mum doing it. Um, so I was learning to hear these things and to sing, uh, as I was learning to walk and to speak. Uh, and we'd, we'd perform as a family, sometimes in church on Sundays, you know, and my mum would arrange these parts for us. Uh, so yeah, we, it was, and there was constant, like my, my parents didn't listen to any secular music, but there was constantly like Christian music or like choral music, quite sort of chamber, old school stuff, uh, all the way up to like contemporary for whenever the time was uh sort of christian music uh but then my brothers and sisters yeah we'd all listen to you know whatever so from like my oldest brother was like into like naughty by nature but then my sister would be into like the pop stuff and um 
it's quite a quite a cool mix i'd say um but yeah it was always in me beautiful mate um i mean my influences when i was young uh one of my heroes back in the day was uh level 42 nice yeah one of the best bass players man that's what i'm saying (laughs) Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And he used to hold his bass guitar quite high and he yeah, used yeah, to yeah. thump against the strings. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a slap, uh, one of the most proficient slap bass players. Like, he used to, like, if you watch videos of him, his thumb is taped up because um, it's just constantly going. It's really, really difficult to do what he does. Really yeah. Hard. So, what, what sort of. Um, guided you to the bass guitar because for anyone that doesn't know yet and i didn't say it in the beginning was you mm. the bass guitar is for the grillers which is yeah they are amazing i <laughs> when damon Auburn mm. came out with them years ago i just loved them straight away their, their style is fantastic mate me too i mean because i was 12 when gorillas came out so yeah. it's like it's it's pretty mad for me thinking that i was a fan of the band and now i sort of play in it yeah um but yeah, I played bass with G- with Gorillaz and with Damon in his solo projects as well. Yeah. Um, but and so, like I said, I mentioned my brother Benga. He he was the bass influence in my initial sort of foray into bass. I was playing a bit of guitar. This was when I was around thirteen, because um, like I said, my dad plays, so I learned a few chords off him. And my mates were starting a band, so I started sort of getting involved in that, uh, just like sort of skate punk sort of kind of angsty teenage stuff obviously uh but he was playing bass and he always he played with quite an interesting style so it wasn't necessarily very traditional he was playing lots of chords and uh lots of strumming and it was always quite interesting and i'd always like sneak a little go not not sneak actually it wasn't hidden but i'd have a go on his guitar um quite a lot and again my first professional gig was on bass even though at the time I didn't even necessarily think of myself as a bass player but it started when I when I started working with Damon he kind of encouraged me a lot um and just discovered that I just was really expressing myself in fact the phrase he said to me which kind of changed it was like mate you're really expressing yourself on that instrument and then like it's just like oh right maybe I'm a bass player in a guitarist body like I'm really really feeling this and now actually i find myself being able to just express what's in my head a lot easier on bass than guitar which is something that i've kind of been playing for longer i guess yeah yeah so every single guest that i have on my podcast Mm. they say it all came with the line of work while drinking right (laughs) whatever they are estate agents yeah (laughs) musicians yeah. And drinking, mm. like I think you listened to James um, podcast last week from Death Havana. Mm. And, and when I was recording it, he said to me, uh, and I really had to hold my nerve with it. He said that he was singing live on stage and the guitars went up to him and said, mate, the mic's 10 foot over oh, there. That hit me like a brick because um, I, I mean... <laughs> It's so mad because there's so many gigs that I've seen that I cannot remember. Yeah. Like great footage. Um, and that's not to say that I necessarily always played pissed, but I've sort of missed out on like half of my career because mm. I was just out of it. And the problem, actually, one of the problems with my uh, drinking, drug use, etc., was like I could always play well. Um, so. I wasn't. I was never a really messy, abusive, angry, blackout drunk. I was always personable, and I could always hang out, etc. The dark thing about my drinking and my just abuse in general was like, I'd actually be okay at work, but my life was in absolute pieces. Yeah. Um, and I would, I, I would, perf- I could perform as if my life was all right. Um, but you know, I'd be spending a grand a week on cocaine and you know not being able to pay rent like yeah. for months and months and months and ducking and diving my brothers and like stealing off my missus do you know what I mean like all this shady shit but mm. uh, but in my head it almost just it almost made like justified it for me it's just like yeah well I can still do my job so yeah I must be all right or it must be all right but that's the thing about 
drinking in particular with music um i think people sort of recoil from drugs like because it seems like an obvious thing to sort of be wary of um but with drinking i think like way back from like my first gigs i can't like you i remember there just being like beer like either being like we were sort of 14 15 when we were playing our first shows at like this is my my skate skate punk band called auto fed um it's playing at the tumbridge wells forum uh big up all the people from bromley um like but you know you get like a little rider even though you're like so underage um but you'd immediately associate playing with drinking from the beginning um and it's sort of seen as cool uh it's so part of it uh that it's so and it's so sort of accepted and um even though you've seen so many car crashes and you've I mean, my goodness, some of our, the biggest heroes like, you know, Keith Richards and stuff like that, um, are famous for being Rex. Yeah. Like, and, but you, but you're still drawn to it and you're still attracted to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to have bad habits in the music industry. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was talking to someone else, Jack from Tova, the band Tova. And he says, Mm. you know, when you're young and you're going to practice in that, you're stoned and you're, Mm-hmm. you're drunk and mm-hmm. it's almost like a trophy isn't it when you can play well when you're wrecked and yeah yeah you know, no it I... is it's it's a again i always i always had this thing with sort of almost like perfection it's like if my playing was all right then i must be all right yeah um which is one of the mad things like i we're probably going to get onto it properly later but it was one of the mad things about going to rehab, which I, I did like a 10 month residential rehab, which was amazing, but brutal at the same time. Like I couldn't touch a guitar, any musical instrument for the first 16 weeks, Wow! which was the longest I hadn't played music since I could play music, which is basically yeah. my whole life. So I'm suddenly the thing that gives me value or the thing that makes me seem like, even though that my world is burning down, that thing that makes me seem all right is taken away. I can't hide behind it anymore. And I had an absolute crisis of identity, like of just what I wanted to do with my life. If I've been, do I even like playing music? It was, dude, that was hard. All these real inner questions you ask yourself, mm. isn't it? Because you, like alcohol's its own crutch, isn't it? Like, and, and when you remove that, it's not mm. just giving up the drinking, it's what it leaves behind. So for me, it, it was, a lifetime of questions that I've been avoiding yeah. came slapping me straight in the face. Yeah. Plus the cravings and what my mates were saying to me and what I was being called because I wasn't drinking. And as you yeah. say, the identity, who am I without this? My name was Glugs, right? And that's the yeah. folk I wore. Mm. Every time I went out, it's like, Glugs is here, you know, get the beers. And so when I, when I removed that cloak, I was naked standing there. I didn't even yeah. know who I was myself, you know. Mate, I didn't even know if, like, I'd, I'd find myself laughing at a joke and I'm like, do I even like, do I even find that funny? Or am I still pretending, am I still playing the character? Yeah. Um, like, it was, it, it was so horrible just having to, face yourself um which has both benefits and but you initially can only see the negative when you have to look at yourself completely clearly in the mirror you now have to face all your regrets you have to look at all the mistakes you made you're like all your cringe moments start flooding in like things you thought you forgot but they're like hello i'm actually here and just like you're just uh crunched over in a corner like crying just remembering the wake of horrible things that you've done but then also one thing i found in that eventually uh, with a lot of help and just uh guidance but just also just also trying to be objective is that if you're objective about it you also find you have to find see the good things in yourself as well like uh you have to objectively look at the terrible things you've done obviously because like you know seek forgiveness where you can and try and repair things that you can repair but also it's like oh right actually how did i manage to still play well um i must be actually good at my job 
oh, actually, I've still got my, my family around me and my close friends. I'm not completely a piece of shit. Like, you have to, because you can really let it just become, like, depression is so self-indulgent and you can really, really let yourself go down this spiral. It's like, oh, well, I'm terrible. Oh, well, I'm just like a waste of space. And then that just is a really good excuse to relapse and just to get bang on it again. Um so you have to, I think you have to find the good things, even in those horrible times to try and claw yourself back. Yeah, it's it's the victim mentality, isn't it? Uh, and it's when you're feeling, when you've removed alcohol, you, you're vulnerable, aren't you? Mm. And, and it's easy sometimes to go to the victim mentality. So why am I like that? Why can't I drink normally? Um, who am I without a drink and whatever? But look, even that last question I said, who am I without a drink? Is yes. who am I without a drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you it's, know what it's... I mean? And when you look inside yourself and you look at the benefits of it, and I quite often say to people with my coaching, it's like always take the positive out of the situation because it's so easy to look at the negative. But it's what you do with it as well. And we're here in the present right mm-hmm. now. So if you've got regrets, you have to kind of deal with them and think, right, what's the best thing I can do with that now? The best thing I can do is learn from those regrets, make amends if you can. Mm-hmm. If you can't, you've got to live with that. But it's what you can do from here forward that. I found that one hard, actually. The things that I can't, like there's some people I've hurt badly that, is irre- like seemingly irreparable and I've sort yeah. of just had to leave alone and that still hurts and uh, I think that's probably the hardest one where it's like actually no matter what you know you how good your intentions are now you have to leave some people alone because actually if you start breaking down their door down being like I'm sorry it's actually not for you it's and it's not for them it's for you and actually yeah. that can become uh, hurtful in itself um but like you say, it's about finding the good. It's like what I found is that, and something that I say, I'm not sure if I got it from somewhere, but the idea in my head is that like the blast radius of your bad decisions is obviously quite wide. Like you hurt people, it affects lots of people, people that you don't even know that you're hurting. Um, but what I found just since say getting sober, getting clean, chatting about it, um, but even not necessarily chatting about it, just the mood around the people around me who love me and can see the difference like i found that the blast radius of your good decisions is way further reaching like i'm helped like just me chatting about getting sober as i get so many messages every day from people and um, from fans across the world who just like oh thank you for sharing this or like i didn't know you could this is kind of cringy but it's like saying stuff like i didn't know that you could be sober and still cool <laughs> um like still do what my what i do and they're like oh my god i can't believe that you're sober and i still you know i'm still into your vibe i thought that cuz like sometimes playing on stage you kind of need a bit of a dangerous attitude um and you think that that drinking or doing coke or doing whatever is part of that but it's like that's in you like you that sort of kind of punk attitude and that sort of uh that that controlled kind of danger chaos whatever you want to call it creativity actually uh thankfully is still in there and i i say to anybody who is a musician or any form of creative who thinks that it's all going to go away when you sober up it's like no 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 it's actually weaponizes you when you when you have clarity because it's like not only do you have clarity access to all your faculties but you have time like you just gain so much time to actually do your projects like at the minute obviously i I play with gorillas and that's about we're about to kick off tour so that's taking up a lot of my time but i also have a radio show on boogaloo radio every saturday that i can do i work out i now go to the gym etc i have time to cook every day and try new recipes um all sorts of different things that and you know i've just scored a uh, like a short film with harley davidson with my friend charlie morton um juggling all of these things i would not have been I, been able to do that at all because like i just used to have maybe two or three workable hours in a day yeah. like because the rest was either i was out of it or just recovering yeah but like i could maybe pop out for something you know so 
yeah, you gain you gain so much time and just headspace. Um, yeah, it's not the actual practicalities of your day; it's the headspace because mm. when you're drinking. Um, the next day, you're thinking about the regret from the last day. How are yeah. you going to manifest the next drink? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's a constant circle of doom when, when you're drinking. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. when you stop, it, it frees up all this time, as you say, which in your industry is, can allow you to be more creative. But isn't it funny what you said earlier that people expect you to be drinking yeah. on drugs, you know, a hard... Yeah, it's it's like you. I used to think this. I think you you. Um, I can't remember if you're chatting about sober shaming uh, yeah, did, with yeah. someone. Yeah, like I used to be one of those guys who was just like I used to say I don't want to work with anybody I can't have a pint with. Yeah, and like all of that stuff. And I used to look down on some people who were say sober or whatever because I was like, you're not really rock and roll. You're not really one of yeah. us. But it's like that's that's terrible <laughs> like what a actual horrible thing to we're all guilty of it i've said some terrible things like mm. i really have uh and i suppose in a way i empathize with people that are like that now because it's lack of education in a way that i was ill educated but now i see the other side you know i was on a boat party the other day and there were 200 people on there all sober and it was right. just the atmosphere was incredible Wow, you know, absolutely cool. incredible. It's almost like a rebirth in people where they found a new path in their life with clarity, mm-hmm. they're authentic, and all the decisions and choices are made with a clear mind rather than, you know, in the morning you're hungover and you're thinking, God, what did I say last night? Did I promise them this? And uh, yeah. did I really send that? How am I going to, you know, it's just so, so cloudy, but yeah. how, how bad did your drinking get before you realized that you had to do something about it? Well, it, so my drinking was always, it was, it was initially just drinking, but then it eventually became coupled hand in hand with cocaine. Um, so it got, I, th- I think right at the end, it was sort of three three months just in my room, like literally with up to the level of the bed height of bottles, rubbish, old food, could not see the floor. I had to jump over it to get to my bed and like I would just would not answer the door. Um, like everything, like my phone was shut off, my internet was shut off. I didn't have any like anything. I was going to the... You know, whenever I could scrape or, you know, lie into getting some money from someone, you know, go to the uh, offie. And it was just like that bottom shelf wine, like three bottles of barefoot or whatever. Um, any acid I could get, stealing fags off the floor. Because um, I was also uh, gave up cigarettes as well, which was which still sometimes is like, just catches you off guard. You sometimes smell a cigarette. It's like, oh, that smells delicious. Um, that one's odd. Um, but it was it was sort of cutting myself and uh, being completely isolated, like crying, like just constantly crying, remembering some traumatic things that happened to me when I was uh, younger as well. Which that oddly that was one of the things that was surprising. It's like, within the fog of this horrendous moment in my life I actually got some old memories came back of some sort of abuse that I had when I was a kid so it's horrendous but that also is one thing that actually was a bit of a call it God call it the universe call it whatever but it was just a bit like there could be a reason beyond you just being a waste of space yeah, yeah. that these things that your life has led to these sorts of things because I grew up in a Christian family, there was no booze in the house ever. Mum and dad do not drink, do not smoke, do not party, do not do any of that stuff. Um, it's you know my brothers and sisters you know drink, but it's like not uh, like yours. I yeah, I never saw anybody stumbling about like pissed in the gaff. Um, yeah, you know all the things I used to do like getting up to drinking in parks and going to parties and stuff was all like under the table. It was all sneaking out and. Uh, you know, so it was none of that stuff 
stemmed from home so it's just like you that's also another part of this way you like you're sort of trying to find your blaming yourself it's just like well how why can't i be good like you know my mum and dad and you know i didn't i wasn't i was never taught this so where's this come from but you find that with say being raised in sort of relatively strict upbringings you tend to <laughs> rebel yeah i was um, say that yeah it, it happens a lot and it's happened a lot to with a lot of my friends and that's not to say that i you know i grew up a believer um but i wouldn't say i am anymore um and you know i've got no beef with that i love my parents absolutely dearly in fact my relationship with them is is the best now than it's ever been post again you talk about being authentic it's like i was expecting them to freak out when they really learned the extent of my use and all that stuff but their their response was just like how can we help let's look i'm gonna look for rehabs like they didn't give me a lecture which is what i expected like they didn't chuck the bible at me which is what i expected um it was just love same with my, my brothers and sisters um and my partner who's just been uh the best she's been with me through it all um and it's been a team sport getting me back on my feet uh and i just received nothing but love but i couldn't i couldn't really put my finger on why like I got it because I didn't get it from my parents or anything like that. But there's lots of little things that have sort of led me down this path and it sort of gradually just crept up. So did you use it, do you think, quite early as an escape mechanism? Because I did. I was 14 Mm. years old and I realised that it fixed my problem. Well, I liked it because it was (laughs) not allowed. Um, That was kind of... The rebelling like friends, in you. Exactly. My friends were doing it. I thought it was cool. Um, again, like rock and roll, you know, I was in, I was playing this like skate punk music. My idols were sort of doing stuff like that. Um, but I just, you know, just wanted to be involved. I always wanted to fit in, which is one of the products of tra- like moving around a lot is that you're kind of always the odd one out. Like when I, like I said, I, I lived in Holland uh, and in Holland, the early nineties, uh, it was, you know, we really was, we stuck out like a sore of thumb. It wasn't, it's quite a racist country at the time. Uh, but you, I, I realized a bit later in life, that I just remembered how horrible some people were to me at school, uh, you know, being a black kid. So you stuck out there and then we moved back to Nigeria, but I moved back to Nigeria from Europe. So all my mates in Nigeria, like, why are you putting on a weird accent? Um, so I stuck out because I wasn't super Nigerian, you yeah. know, and then, so you try, I, you try your best to fit in, you sort of pick up, uh, accents and, uh, then I moved to England and it's like, I've come straight from Lagos. Um, and again, like I'm suddenly another with a name like Cher, people like, oh, you sound like Cher the singer and it becomes yeah. a little like joke. Uh, so I'm immediately trying to fit in there. So again, it, it's, it's constant constantly trying to like have no attention drawn to yourself yeah um which at the but at the same time attracting lots of attention um like i always i always felt that um so when my mates like you know as you do and not to say that there's a healthy kind of drinking when you're 14 <laughs> um but some people you know it's what a lot of people do and you sort of lots of people grow out of it and it's not it doesn't necessarily become of heavy problem but again it creeps up you start doing it a little bit at house parties on just on the weekend um with your friends um and then eventually you start sort of finding bottles of stuff and just like being like oh what's this like when everyone's at the party you go through the cabinets and have yeah. a swig of whatever i'll call it <laughs> <Beer Berkeley>. <laughs> <laughs> i used to do it in clubs i mean how grim is that i used to oh. So when everyone went on the dance floor, I'd go around nicking people's pints and glugging oh, them down, you know. And so I mean, hectic. that's mad, isn't it? <laughs> but so when you uh, were booked into the rehab, was that when mm-hmm. you sorted it all out? So yeah, it was kind of because it was a really drastic change, and actually, it was quite shocking to Kaz, my missus, uh, because I hadn't tried. I didn't try. I'd never tried to get sober or clean or anything before this. I'd never tried to quit drinking. I, I I loved it 
like until I hated it, like, and even when I hated it, I still wanted to do it. I'd never tried giving up anything. Um, so I think I was like, Kaz was like a bit like, aren't you going to try something, maybe like a little program or something that doesn't have to take you in, but programs are expensive. And my, my folks managed to find this program called teen challenge. Uh, and it's free. Like you go on benefits to, to sort of go on it. It's a Christian rehab, um, which turns a lot of people off actually, but it turns out it was a great, great program. I walked into the the doors at the Willoughby house center. So there's a few different centers across the country. Um, it's like in, in Wales, in London, uh, sort of near Leicestershire, Glasgow, I think up, up in Scotland as well. Um, and I just felt love in that place. And like April 1st to 2019, I walked in those doors and I've been, I stopped everything on that day. Um, and it's, it's a really hard program because it is 10 months at this center, which is like in the middle, like in the middle of a motorway. So it's nowhere near like any, anywhere really. Um, it's no phones, no TV, no internet. Um, no the guitar. only th- no guitar um even though but there was like there were guitars there because it's a it's a christian program so you you have chapel like every day and you have like a, you go to church on the weekends and like there was music that was the hard thing it's like i wanted to play in the church band which i again i grew up doing even though i was doing all my whatever i was doing on the saturday night on the friday night on the Thursday night, whatever, I would always be playing in the church band because I fit in, I knew how to do it, um, I knew all the right things to say, etc. Um, but not only is it hard because, like, uh, yeah, it's 10 months in that place, but it's a really demanding program. So, like, um, shall I run you through, like, a typical day Yeah. at Teen Challenge? So you're up at, like... And this is coming from someone who has no structure. I've been a touring musician, self-employed. Yeah. Lived in loads of places. Lived in loads of places. Like, I do... I've never had, like, a daily routine. Yeah. Um, so this was... And I can't remember... if I can't remember... These timings aren't exactly, but this was a typical day. So you're up at 7.15, um, and immediately you hoover and tidy your room. Like, you, you have a roommate. Like, um, it's all lads as well. Uh, this centre, they split them into men's and women's sort of centres. Um, all men, it's called Teen Challenge, there were no teenagers there. Um, I was actually one of the youngest, uh, and I went in there, I was like 29 or something. Um, and you immediately have to clean, because your room gets ex- inspected every day, every morning. So like, you make your bed, you have to make it really nice, you have to clean your bathroom, you have to hoover up the room. This is all first thing as soon as you get up. And then quarter to, that's 7.15, quarter to eight, you go down um, to the main living room. And again, if you're late, you get like a tick against your name and you have to do like an extra washing up or you lose some sort of privilege. Um, and that's for 15 minutes of quiet time, which was probably my favorite time in the day. Between 7.45 and eight in the morning, you could read a Bible, you could read whatever book you're reading or just sit there in silence, meditate, look out the window, whatever. But it was just everybody started the day with just a moment of calm, which was great. Um, sort of really centered you. Then you have breakfast at eight. Um, and with every meal, you could be working in the kitchen, helping bring out the food or helping prepare the food. That was actually one of my favorite parts of the program. I ended up in the kitchen a fair amount. Um, that's eight till half eight. Half eight, you are doing, you, st- you start to clean the everybody has jobs to clean the building because it's like it used to be like a best western hotels it's quite a big place so you get allotted some jobs it changes every week you could be cleaning in the foyer you could be doing the men's toilets you could be doing all sorts of different things then you have chapel at nine um till about nine forty five, um and then at 10 you have like your first uh module of the day so there were, there were 13 courses you had to take um, before you could pass the program. Uh, and they're, they're a range of different different things. There's Christian-based ones, but then there's also things just like loving and accepting myself, uh, anger and personal rights, like all these things that you sort of are dealing with that actually for a lot of men, do you do not ever sit and think about, oh, how do I actually approach my anger? Um, 
or loving accepting myself like through failure and the, all the horrible things you've done how do I look at myself objectively and love it um which I found that was a really powerful one. The anger and personal rights program, you had to be in really small groups because it could get pretty leery. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like guys, you know, floods of tears, shouting, etc. Like it was because a mate, oh, like I just saw some broken lives, man. It was not that many people finished the program because uh, it's voluntary, but I must have seen about 100 people come and go in 10 months who just couldn't finish it because it's just yeah. a lot. Um, but you do that to like 10, 10 45 then you have a cup of tea you can only get cups of tea at certain periods of time in the day so you can't just be in the kitchen all the time uh, and then you carry that on that whatever pro, uh, module that was till i think about quarter to 12 or something got a little bit of free time then you have lunch uh and again and the food is really good actually that was another reason why people kept on leaving because say you're going in there i got in there i was like nine and a half stone and i'm six two so I was an absolute rake when I went in there, but a month of just eating good food, like you put on a stone, you start, you look at yourself in the mirror uh, and you think, oh man, I'm doing all right, actually. Like I'm, I'm clean, like I'm looking all right. So people get out the door, especially like heroin addicts, actually, they would be out the door quick because they said, oh, actually I'm all right. I don't need this. Yeah. And then literally within a week, they'll be calling up trying to get back in, but yeah. their bed's been taken. Um, that was really important actually the food was really really good um, and then you did uh, you have yeah you'd have lunch have a little break and then it was like your work duties for the day so between like 1 and 4 p.m like is it like I said it was a big there were big grounds so like you could be you know doing the gardening like mowing the lawns and stuff uh, you could be working on like painting something doing um, electric work you could be um, there was also like a woodwork shop like down the road where lads made things and it was actually sold in the charity shop, some of them. Um, there was also sometimes like IT courses. There was a kitchen safety, you know, getting like a qualification to, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but there was, you know, stuff like that. Um, but that was a hard part of the day. So that was like a, a few hours, um, again, working in the kitchen, that was quite hard because it was, you were feeding like 40, 50 people every day for every meal. Um, and then it will come to four, you have a bit of a break, and then you have dinner at half five, um, to about half, uh, and then a bit of time off till about half six, seven, where you have your evening session, which is, um, called personal studies where, which is in silence, which was again, hard for like 30 men like who are adults used to doing all kinds of madness to sit yeah, in okay. silence to either work on your workbook from whatever module you did in the morning or again do reading whatever um but you couldn't you couldn't sleep and you couldn't write personal letters i think in that time you had to do some sort of study um i was till like seven forty five. then you had a cup another cup of tea um or sometimes we'd have we'd watch like a like a preaching video or something like that um but that would take you through till about half eight quarter to nine um uh, yeah chapel at nine uh till nine thirty or nine forty five something like that you had to be upstairs at 10 so all the lads were we were upstairs and on the one hallway um so everybody upstairs you can go back down for a cup or anything like that 10 you had to be in your rooms half 10 lights out 10 45 repeat well it sounds like prison yeah, I mean, so there were lads. There were lads who said prison was easier. Yeah, um, there were lots of people who actually had been to prison because you could still, you know, in prison, obviously you can get, you can still get whatever you want. You can still get drugs. You can still drink. Yeah. You can still find. You can find ways of getting around. But this was like a zero, complete abstinence yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, so, like mentally, it's extremely challenging, especially when you're coming from a life of no structure as a lot yeah, of addicts and are. and at that age as well, where, um, so when you came out after 10 mm -hmm. months, how did you then, you were 10 months clean, right? Mm -hmm. Was there any yeah. education in there to help you with your drug and alcohol addiction? So, yeah, we did a, a little bit, but actually it was more on like a spiritual side of yeah. things. And, a lot of people who who came out of the program they were 
thankfully I had I've you know, come from a family that was able to support me. So I actually went from Willoughby House, I went to my mum and dad's in um, uh, Lancashire, um, up in Chorley. Um, so I stayed with them. A lot of people go on to like a, pro, a halfway house or some sort of other program to re because you still have six months on the program where you have to check in every week with your advisor um slash counselor from the center etc but, but but i wouldn't say I, I came out with much formal like i didn't learn about you know brain chemistry and you know things like that it was more like on the sort of spiritual mental mental side of things mm -hmm. of how to deal with addiction and what is done yeah. um but no, actually thinking about it now, I actually am quite ill-educated in the physiological side of um, addiction. It's only through sort of really listening to people like yourself and other other great sort of podcasters and reading up on things and um, chatting to like uh, my therapist have I really sort of started to break down that side of things. Um, but what, what Team Challenge did was not, not just get me clean, etc., but sort of sort, help start the process of sorting out my head and my heart, mm, really. I can see um, it. And to be honest, mate, it it really doesn't matter how you do it. It's, it's if it yeah, works, you know. Exactly. And, you know, like AA didn't work for me. But since then, I've been more open-minded because I, I've kind of thought I was in the wrong meeting and maybe I should have gone to two <laughs> or three others. Right. Because the people might not have suited me or... You know, and and really, uh, because I was right at the beginning, I, I I was, well, this isn't working for me, so mm. what else will? Looking for solutions, but the solution was in myself. You know, yeah. uh, and, and it took me some time to realise that, and with the support of the sober community, which is amazing, isn't it? It's like unbelievable. Um, I can believe it. Like that's one thing. Also, starting to talk about my sobriety in the music industry i was really taken aback by the amount of people who messaged me who i've known for years or i hadn't seen because i was away for a couple of years were like dude i'm sober now i or people that i had known from before so I, that i didn't realize were sober and not just in terms of playing but you think about people in record labels like especially if they, they've been in the industry from like the 80s and 90s when it was like proper like just cash everywhere yeah like i know a few sort of publishers who are like you know, on the sober journey now. And it's like, it's really opened up actually a, a new side of things that was really encouraging. Cause again, you don't really see that, but you're probably surrounded by sober people all the time. Yeah. But also these conversations that you have as, you know, as a role model, like you are to so many different age groups as well, mm. you know, it creates that spark of conversation in their own mind, right? Yeah. So they're not going to judge and go, what's wrong with you? You're sober now. Because there's such a movement growing. People will go, God, there's another one. And he's amazing. And his music yeah, yeah. and the band. And God, that makes me feel like, should I sort my drinking up? All these conversations that we have, little nuggets, um, little one-liners that we say, you know, a good friend of mine, she's given up drinking because she heard me say moderation is like dumping your ex and sleeping with them at the weekend. <laughs> I remember that. That was like, that yeah. was pretty deep. <laughs> do you know what I mean, though? It, I do. And people relate to that. And that, that stuck in her mind. And she's now 100 and something days sober. And it was because of that one line. And it's things like you might put out there or the conversations that can have a ripple effect that that can it's change like I was saying, life. It's exactly what I was saying about how the blast radius of your good decisions goes f way further than you could ever know. Like there's people that you've, that have never said anything to you. I'm, I'm talking about you specifically because what you do is so amazing, but it's probably someone at like your local Tesco's or something who might have known you back in the madness yeah. who's just been looking at you from afar being like, I cannot believe that's the same person. Yeah. Like it's, I've been, I've been truly astounded at like, and I don't like preaching at people about, you know, I work with people who, you know, drink, etc. cetera, whatever. Um, thankfully I must say this, I'm, I'm super well supported. I'm, I'm actually really lucky to be playing with the people that I play with because, um, again, they've seen it all. They, you know, they're not scared by anything. They're like, look, if you need, you need us, you know, we're going to give you every help. I've got all the help I, I need. 
I was asked if I wanted to come back. They didn't expect me to come back because they knew what it is. And thankfully, with the pandemic, it's sort of st slowed my return to doing what we do, which was actually really helpful because I've had to do a lot of work. Obviously, I'm only three years into this journey. Um, you got four, it was four years recently, right? No, no, no. I'm the same as you. Um, right. I'm three. Uh, you said April, right? 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was January. So. Man. Yeah, I think you saw one of my posts where it says four years ago, uh, right. I had that really, really big rock bottom that started the process for me, you know. And, you know, it's important to say you don't actually always need a rock bottom to do that. But for me, it was no. like, God, do you know what? I escaped death. Yeah. Then, yeah. And, and it made me look at it differently. It was a real slap in the face, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'd say you shouldn't, don't wait for rock bottom because number one you may not come back yeah 100% um, but also rock bottom may not be enough because the amount of rock bottoms you should have you probably went through before hitting that one yeah. like there were so many times when you woke up in places that you shouldn't have been or like ended up in hospital or were throwing up for a two days straight it's like you should have stopped then but you keep the problem with addicts is like you keep pushing through rock bottoms yeah like the like you somehow manage to just tunnel quite easily through stuff. I mean, how many times do you say to yourself, I'm never going to do this again? Yeah. Like, I don't want to do this. And you just find a way. I, I, I would, for those people listening who are, um, be, like, don't, don't let it get to where you have to do it. It's like it, things happen so much better when you walk into it as opposed to a crash and, like, fall in. I honestly caveat that with the, the fact that I find, uh, and this is not generalizing to the extreme, mm -hmm. but most men mm. wait for the rock bottom where, where, True. you know, they can't like what you were saying in, in your place, your rehab place is that you get 30 men there trying to deal with their emotions <laughs> and that. And it's, <laughs> it sometimes goes against the grain. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and you know, like yeah, I talk to a lot of men. Oh, my my followers are eighty five percent women, but right. the men that are the curtain twitches that um, <laughs> might send me a DM and they go, "Mate, I'm really worried about my drinking. Uh, what mm. can I do?" Um, so they think, do you know what? It's that old thing. It's just a few beers with a football. What you're talking about? I ain't got a problem. But deep down, they know they have got a real problem. But they can't even start to begin. How to yeah. address that? Um, so they hit the rock bottoms, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm trying to do: is to open the conversation that it's okay for men to cry. It's okay yeah. for men to reach out and show their vulnerabilities, yeah. um, and to accept help as well. You know, accepting help is probably because again, I think actually even acknowledging the problem. A lot of you know, men can do, but it's then because you have to not just know it, you have to do something about it. Yeah. And to do something about it, you need to talk to someone. You need to at least raise it with your mates. Like, uh, that's really, really hard. Like, it, it was, again, it was overwhelming how supportive people were. I, I thought, you know, you say you're going to rehab, it's like, okay, you're a failure. Um, you know, you're useless, like you've clearly, you know, really, really messed up, etc. But it's like, actually, what it actually is, is you're trying to sort yourself out. And the real ones around you are going to be supportive of that. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you'd be surprised at how many people are fighting your corner, like would or will be once you start actually doing something about it, because you've said sorry a million times, you haven't paid the money back, you don't, you've lied, cheated, steal, da, 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 da. It's like, no one cares about you apologizing. Like, uh, what's it called? There's one phrase that I think I heard in, we were saying in rehabs, it's like, your behavior doesn't lie. Um, and it's like, until you start doing something, you can tell someone you love them all the time, but until you actually show them that you love them in some actual way by doing something, um, it doesn't matter. Until you actually make a physical step in this actual physical universe to do mm. something you can say you're sorry or you like or you can think you need help or you like but actually unfortunately such fortunately means you actually stepping out and doing something yeah 
and you also find out who you who the people are around you so you said before it'd have been mm-hmm. quite easy for your family to have judged you on it and, and looked at what you'd done wrong but instead they said okay we're here to support you and and you find mm-hmm. that with your real true friends because the yeah the beer mates you know your mm-hmm. drinking buddies down a pub, all they're thinking about is how it's going to affect their drinking if you stop drinking. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's true. So they're not your true friends, but the people that stick with you love you for you, the essence of you. Yeah, uh, that's, and that's, that's important. That really is. And actually, speaking of Paloma, like, she's she's a real one. Like, okay, we don't professionally work together anymore, but... Like, because I went off the radar. I didn't tell that many people that I was going in, um, but I sort of just disappeared for a bit. And it came up, it was coming up to like the 10 year anniversary of her first album or something. And she was like, oh, I need to chat to Cher. Where is he? And she saw that I was sort of a bit AWOL and like was calling up my mates, like uh, my girl Lex. And she was like, oh, is this still Cher's number? Like, what is he? Like, she found my number and she, or she found out what was going on. And then she called up the rehab and like the receptionist was like, Cher, I think Paloma Faith is on the phone uh-huh. for you. and couldn't believe it. So she tracked, she tracked me down and like had, we had a couple of nice phone calls. Um, like she's a real one. Like she was like, oh, he sounds like he's in trouble and she's, but she's been a wonderful, beautiful, beautiful support as have like, again, my, all my closest friends from, you know, I'm from Bromley and all my sort of bezies are, have been, not that they've condoned everything. No, they haven't just been like, hey, like I heard, I learned a lot of home truths. That was a hard thing as well. Like hearing, my family was supportive, but I got some letters in there of my family telling me how hard it had been and just like breaking down how hurt they were for certain things, which was ultimately healthy. Um, but also with some of my friends, like they, it wasn't, hasn't just been a completely easy route back. Um, but what has helped has been my consistency in, changing the way that I live that's been the best apology that I could ever do to anybody it's like well I'm actually now actively clearly a different person and doing way way better and that that's really helped to mend uh relationships that's why I said earlier about being in the present right because some of the things I did I was under the influence of a highly addictive toxic drug that is accepted Mm -hmm. all over the world right and i bought Mm -hmm. into it straight away i was like this bitcoin maniac that has gone yeah this is it (laughs) from the age of 14 right and i i was hook line and sinker and and a lot of things i did i didn't even know i did so i kind of excuse it in a way that look i really (laughs) wasn't myself back then but i'm my true authentic self now trying to live my mm-hmm. best life, trying to be the kindest, most honest, giving person I can be for myself and others. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how I try and make up for it now because yeah, giving back is a huge thing in this community. Um, it, yeah, it really is. And that's not to say that once you are sober everything's all right and that's not to say that you become a perfect person Uh it's like um yeah not at all you but it's still like it is a process and you're still working on stuff um like it's not it's not an immediate switch or anything like that you still make mistakes like yeah make mistakes when you're pissed you still make mistakes when you're sober like it's it's not it it doesn't just change will be there's there's no finish line it's sobriety you have to work work at it for the rest of your life but you're giving yourself the best chance you can and that includes Mm -hmm. even food choices health you say you go to the gym conversations with people that you remember there's a million things on the list you can add to sobriety that you know creativity what what's your Mm -hmm. you're 34 this year what is your music Mm -hmm. ability is going to be like in 10 years time through having a clear mind whatever it is i mean i'm already me mate because uh (laughs) yeah no definitely i mean we got some shows coming up mate give me a shout um no, like I, I already feel it. Like I know I'm better now than I was, you know, 
three, four years ago. Like I've never felt so confident and so competent. Like before I like, it was so horrible. Like I was, I'd be on stage in front of say 50,000 people. All I wanted to do was get off stage and have my line and have a drink. Like yeah. by the end of it, it was just like playing shows was getting in the way. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, I was the whole time not confident. Like I looked, you know, I was like eh, having it on stage, but in my head I was thinking, oh mate, that was shit. Oh, that was shit. Oh mate, am I in time? Oh God, like, oh, people look at me, I'm terrible. Da, da, da. Like it was such a, it was, it, I felt terrible like a lot of the time, which sounds horrible to say and mad to think that you, I'm doing this amazing job and playing these great shows. Uh, but in my head, I was like, this is crazy and I felt really insecure but now that I'm sober I, I'm still a little bit like because there's insecurity there but I know that I'm good at what I do like it's not clouded in mm. any rubbish anymore it's like mm. I feel good because I've worked hard and like these we just did uh, 10 straight days rehearsals for this uh, new gorillas tour um, which are really hard but they were the most productive rehearsals we've ever had. I think everyone is just like, we just, we've had a few years off. We're ready to rock and roll. Everyone's like a bit clearer. There's a, you know, other people sort of in, some people like on in recovery journey, some people like there's just a beautiful atmosphere and everybody wanting the best for everyone else. Um, and which has always been the case, but it's just like, there just feels like, it feels like a new breath of fresh air. I don't know. And we just, we're just so on fire because mm. we're just a bit, there's just a bit more clarity there. And I've, mm. I've actually never felt better. And I feel have like they, have they seen a big difference in you? Have they mentioned it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Like, in fact, one of the things, yeah, it's, it's been really lovely actually hearing that feedback. And in one respect, it's been great to people say like, oh, you look great. Like I've put on some timber, um, all of that, but people have been commenting about the things that I care about. It's like, not just that I look good, but it's like, oh, I'm playing well. And, uh, oh, you look so bright. And, you know, you, you can really tell that you're feeling energy, good about yourself. Energy. Like, yeah, it translates. Like, you don't realize how far that can get. Like, you, you project, when you're feeling good about yourself, you project it. One of the saddest things that, um, from when I was still using, I heard, like, I remember... Uh, being at Victoria Station, um, going through the barriers, about to get on a train and um, getting tapped on the shoulder. And it was my friend Hannah. Um, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this. It was my friend Hannah and her mum and a sister. Um, and, you know, when you, I was in such a darkness at that time, like really, really sad, really down. And I was like, oh, hey, guys, I can't really talk. I'm, you know, because I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to speak to anybody. I just wanted to sit on the train. I was like, hey, bye. Um, but I heard... Uh, years later um, that the way I looked just even from behind you could tell how dark I felt um, because I because th I think Hannah said something like they thought I was someone who, they they looked at me and just like oh that person looks so sad like oh shit mm. I think we should get that person some food or something because from behind I looked you could tell that I was was just super super low sorry Hannah if I didn't recount that story well um but the the what I'm trying to say is it the darkness was palpable it was it was clear even without looking at my face that my body language the mm. way my clothes were hanging off my body because I was so so thin yeah it was like oh man and they, then they realized oh shit that share and just like then said hello but it's like fuck like I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I thought I was still relatively slick, but I was projecting all this funk because I was just bringing this darkness with me because I hated being out. Like, I hated leaving my flat for whatever reason. Like, because I just didn't want to bump into anybody. Um, I got super agoraphobic by the end of it. Like, I just get, like, anxiety about leaving the flat, about having to face anyone and face any anything full stop like my, when my phone would ring I had to change my phone ringtone because it was so it's still to this day I hear it like this Samsung ringtone and it's so triggering to me because it's the it's the sound I avoided like the plate yeah I, I, just I didn't really like... relate to that yeah because I, I lived on mine for 10 years and in the end 
even my neighbours. I lived in a row of six cottages, right? Mm. Um, so everyone kind of, it's like a little commune. <laughs> right. But when I started drinking, my isolated drinking kicked in. They mm. say, oh, we're having a party Saturday night. Come and join us. I used to sit in, in the dark, behind the sofa with a, bot- a litre of vodka and some tonic be- because I didn't want to go next door, because I didn't want to socialise. I didn't mm. want to have my drinking controlled either because I thought I've got to talk to people. I can't get too yeah. drunk. I look like shit. Um, yeah. So I sat, it, it was the weirdest thing. Ugh, it's not and then the I one, would like... crawl up on my hands and knees to bed and fall into bed and, and, and I could hear it all going off in the garden laughing. Fun. And I was almost like, F off, you know. like Angry, almost, yeah. You know? I had that the Christmas before I went in. Like, I think I told... I told people that, like, that I was on my own at for that Christmas. Um, I had... I'd been invited to different things for that Christmas, but I was just like... I, was, I, I turned people down. I ended up just have Christmas was like a few bottles of wine and an eight ball alone, like you say, in the dark, just in my flat, being sad, but also being angry that I wasn't, that no one was breaking my door down, dragging me out to their Christmas thing. I was like, oh, doesn't anybody care? But I was like, well, I said no to everyone. Like I yeah. told people that I was fine or I was, or I lied saying, oh, I might be spending it here or something. Like that isolation, which is the, it's the, uh, it feeds the worst thing you, you could possibly do is like yeah. keeping secrets and isolating. Like that's when that's one of my my sort of um, red flags that I when I know that I'm probably on the road to sort of relapse, which happens way before you actually take anything. But it's like when I start hiding where I'm going, or if I start lying about little things like that, um, just saying I'm like, Oh, I'm too busy to do something and just like there's just shady stuff like that which is just telltale signs that you're probably headed back yeah um red flag in, in, that, in that direction yeah yeah like you you've got to be wary of of those things like I mean I've had it with sugar obviously since being sober which has been a, yeah. a big one I had it with alcohol free beers like I found my I, which I do like every now and then but it's like I but at one point I was just like mate I was having them every night i was just like that's what's the what am i doing like yeah. what is the point that's not it's not it's not one-to-one obviously because i used to get absolutely fucking smashed but stuff like that is like okay i need to not do that for a while or yeah for who knows um i moved on to the kombucha now we, oh i love um, a bit of that but it's <laughs> yeah no, i live i live next to a waitrose man <laughs> it's got to be done um <laughs> Yeah, yeah, bougie. I'm and I've got money for kombucha well. now because I'm not... <laughs> yeah, um, good for your gut. Um, that's another thing, man. You've got so much more money, um, which, you know, you can still make mistakes with and can still waste and squander, but at least I'm squandering... I'd be squandering my money on my sort of terms, you know, and not on, like, yeah. some illegal stuff or, you know, yeah. like, because I would just have no cash. Like, finishing tours, like, world tours and having no money to yeah, show for it. It's madness, like, ridiculous. It? Just chucking it oh, away, God, but terrible. look, I'm aware of the time because my podcast is, you know, one for the road. I like to keep it within an hour, and I can honestly say that I could talk to you for absolute hours. You've got a lovely, mate, lovely too. energy Love about you, mate. And honestly, you're just the loveliest guy. Oh, thank you. Um, and I appreciate, appreciate you coming on. What before we go? What have you got coming up so the listeners can uh, look forward to coming to see you, maybe? So, yeah, like I said, Gorillas were on the road for the first time in a long time. So we're about to kick off a tour. Like, I leave a week, a week today actually, to head to Uruguay. Um, so we're going to be in South America for a month, but then we come to Europe and do like two months of festivals and some of our own shows. So we're doing uh, in England though. We're playing All Points East Festival. Um, it's the end of August, I think. Um, and there's loads of stuff on the continent that would be really fun to come to, um, and. At the minute, that's all I think we've announced. Um, hopefully, there's going to be some more shows. Um, again, it's still kind of mad doing shows because you don't know if COVID or... Like, we had to cancel two shows, obviously, because we we're going to play Moscow, then Kiev. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, so, so that's not happening. Oh. Um, you just don't know what's... Um, 
what's around the corner. So um, hopefully there'll be some more shows. Uh, we'll see. But at the minute, All Points East is our only uh, London show. Hopefully there might be a Dublin show as well. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. But yeah, head to like the Gorillas website and it might be worth coming to like Primavera or if you're looking for a good summer fezzy on the continent, we're doing lots. So come check us out. Fantastic, mate. And you're a real inspiration. You really are. And I feel so grateful that um, you've agreed to do this. And I'm sure people are comment after and i i know they'll be saying what an absolutely lovely guy oh, so, <laughs> i hope so <laughs> no they will trust me they will i i know my listeners and you are mm. anyway whether they do or not so <laughs> I, i'm telling you <laughs> yeah. like me please the bloody addict in me just like wanting it um I but not mate I, I i only recently got into uh listening to your podcast but i've literally like i'm saying we're just doing those uh rehearsals for 10 straight days on the way uh, to rehearsals every day I was popping it on and I found your story and just the guests you've had on just so so inspiring and again the sober community which I've discovered through social media um, has been so cool and it's opened so many doors and it's challenged me a lot in a lot of ways like because again I didn't do a 12-step program but yeah. looking into say things from that that I think would be useful and like checking out someone else's kind of style of recovery or whatever some I know some people who aren't completely abstinent I know some people still smoke it's like oh there's all this like conversation like you say like you're a gray area right um, yeah sort of looking at not just being on a side, like I'm a 12 step side, I'm a complete, yeah. like, it's like, how can we all make each other better? And yeah. I always say this, that this is a team sport. Yeah, you I cannot do it alone. There's oh, no, no way you can do it alone. And yeah. Um, yeah, we, everybody needs help no matter who you are. Yeah. Uh, and, and where you say I'm a gray area, I'm a gray area drinking coach, but I was never that because I was right down the other end of the scale. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel that's more specialist. So I, I help people that have got other things going on. And also, mm. I, I, you know, we li if you can listen to someone without judgment, that alone is really giving more support to someone than that you realise you know yeah without saying well try and do this can't you do that and like just listening yeah. for people to yeah. unload that is mm -hmm. such powerful work because there is nothing worse than someone telling you how to sort your life out it's ah. just like you don't Especially know you don't me. like being told what to do like me exactly like yeah like a lot of people um and actually what's even worse what could be more damaging is if you're a super subservient person who say because of tra trauma or whatever, it's like you just agree with people. Like I'm a people pleaser. So, you know, which is an issue to, to, to the extent that it can be, but it's like you could suggest something to someone that may actually harm them, but they'll do it because say someone who's prominent has yeah. suggested it. Yeah. Like it's really, it's re you have to be really sensitive. And uh, like you say, the first and easiest thing you can do to help someone is just let them talk to you. Yeah. Um, and that is the, that is actually the strong, one of the best things you could possibly do, especially if you're starting on the sobriety journey, don't think about a program. Don't think about buying anything. Don't think about spending a single cent. Find someone just to talk to. Yeah. Like it's going to help a, a, a you. A close friend, you know, yeah. someone you trust, um, just to get the process going. Even if you're not ready to give up drinking, if, if you can- Over a pint. <laughs> yeah. If need be. Well, but that's true though, mate. It, yeah. it, it, it's true. It's like you could have a pint and say, I'm really beginning to feel quite anxious about how much I'm drinking. Uh, yeah. And that, that starts a ball rolling. And, you know, as soon as you open the door, mm -hmm. it can start that process, you know? And, and that's what happened with me in that April. Um, four years ago, when when I I just thought I enough the party's got to end here because otherwise I'm going to end, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the realization of that it took me another few months to do it. But in those few months, I had various different conversations with people that I trusted, mm. and then I came to that decision on my own, which was rock and roll, the best thing. Yeah. Share, my man. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dave. Good luck with everything, and I hope to see you and meet you in real life very yes, soon. Yes, mate. Hopefully, man. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure, mate. Bless. Bye.